Welcome back here with us on Urban Debate on Mirror Now. Let's now discuss succession law in India. A provision in this law puts the husband's family first when it comes to inheritance. If a woman dies without a will, yes. In India, when a Hindu man dies, the properties left behind uh, by him are to be distributed equally among the wife, children and his mother. And if they aren't there, then the properties go to his father. However, when a Hindu woman dies without a will, her properties, including self-acquired assets, shall be inherited by her children and husband not her parents. We're discussing this tonight as the centre has defended this in Supreme Court. In its response to a petition before the Supreme Court, which says that the sections 15 and 16 of the Act unveil deeply rooted patriarchal ideology. So I want to ask tonight, is this a hurdle in march to equality? How valid is it? in 21st century and joining us on the broadcast on this particular issue is Karun Anandi who is an advocate in the Supreme Court. We also have with us Navit Saxena, advocate on record, Supreme Court joining us on Urban Debate tonight. Thank you very much both of you for joining us here on Mirror Now this evening. Karun Anandi, I want to begin the discussion with you. Uh, how valid is it in 21st century when a lot has changed from the time this law came into place? You know, uh, it's based, the Indian, uh, the Hindu Succession Act, on the Mitakshara and Dayabhaga systems that are really, really outdated now because a woman doesn't just leave her family and join her husband's family, not work, uh, not acquire property of her own. Um, and now to say that she loses her sort of other relationships when she uh, gets married, I think is, is, is ridiculous. Um, there's a bit of an illusion that the Hindu Succession Act of 2005 gets rid of the um, uh, patriarchy and misogyny in the law that takes property away from uh, women, you know, in particular ways. Um, and it doesn't completely. And one of the remnants, because, you know, there's still, even in Section 8, which is, you quite correctly noted, speaks of how the husband leaves his property, right? Um, and it's, it's a better situation than uh, a woman's self-acquired property. But if you look at the last bits, right, there's the distinction between agnets, which is if you, uh, a line that is purely male, and cognates, which is mixed male and female. And so these kinds of things are outdated and anti-constitutional because if you look at section 15, which is the focus of the Kopkar petition, section 15 and section 16, what they say is that if a female Hindu is dying intestate, which is without a will, then the property shall devolve, as uh, shall be inherited first by the sons and daughters, fine, no problem, um, and the husband, and then second upon the heirs of the husband. Now, what happened in a case called uh, Om Prakash versus Radha Charan was that a woman called Narayani, I mean, I think she was only married for three months or something. And then she went back to her own family, uh, to her natal family, to her own family, and start, you know, acquired property. And when she died many, many years later, then the in-laws showed up to claim the property. And in that case, perhaps the... Supreme Court's hands were tied because there wasn't a constitutional challenge, um, as far as I'm aware, to sections 15 and 16. Now the time has really come and there shouldn't be any debate about this because women's autonomy, women's um, agency, women's ability to own property and to, to sort of have it devolve to their families, husband's families, hu husband family in a way that is, in a way you know, that is you know, reflective of actual relationships, I think, is, is important. Um, and Section 14 is very clear on equality, but Section 15 comes into, uh, I mean, I beg your pardon, Article, Article 15 of the Constitution of India comes into play here. What Article 15 says is that you cannot discriminate, the burden is higher if you're discriminating on the basis of sex, which there is a discrimination here. And what is that burden? Um, that there is a strict scrutiny 
that comes in. And that strict scrutiny, first, if there is a prima facie case, the burden actually of showing that it's not uh, discriminating on the basis of sex in an invalid manner goes to uh, the government. And then the right. government must show that one, there is a compelling state interest in that discrimination. What is the state interest to say that it, it's not going to go to your own parents and to your own, uh, and that is going to go to your husband's first, your own self-acquired property? Um, so that's one thing. And the second thing is that um, the burden is higher. And from what I've seen, that has not been discharged. But of course, the court will decide. But the issue is, does is it in the teeth of Articles 15 and 14? And according to me, you see the Anuj Garg judgments, you see the Joseph Schein judgments on stereotypical uh, roles for women, you see... Uh, and I don't think this, this right. should really survive in this day and age. Okay. Uh, Namit Saxena, the center clearly has defended this in the Supreme Court uh, in an affidavit that was filed yesterday. What is your opinion? Do you see it as a hurdle in March to equality? Do you agree with what Karuna has to say that probably it is time to now have a relook at it? It's time to change it? I'll tell you how I differ with uh, uh, Karuna. See, it is important to read section 14, 15, and 16 together of the Hindu succession. And you have to remember that this is a succession act as to how property devolves down below and how it percolates downwards is one. Second, 14, section 14, 15, and 16, they form a code as to how succession of Hindu females has to be read when they die intestate. So section 14 says that whatever, that the, the, it defines the property and says that a woman will be the complete owner of the property, which includes movable, immovable, includes if the property is inherited or self-acquired or uh, falls through partition or uh, anything else. Now, what Section 15 says is, if a Hindu female dies intestate, it will firstly go to the sons and daughters, and if there are no other husband, if there are none, then the, to the heirs of the husband. Now, Section 15 Clause 2 is very important. What it lays down is that in case the property is inherited by a female Hindu who dies intestate, if, it, if the property devolves from the father or mother of that particular female Hindu, that will go back to the father. If that property comes from the husband or is inherited from the husband or is inherited from the in-laws of the husband or, or in-laws uh, of that particular female Hindu, it will go back to the husband. So the, the gray area which remains is that if there is a self-acquired property, what to do? So they, it is there when Section 15 Clause 1 Clause B kicks in that it will go to the heirs of the husband. Now it is important to note who are the heirs of the husband. That is where Section uh, 8 of this Act of Hindu Succession Act and the schedule which is appended to the Act comes into picture. Now Section 8 says it divides the heirs of a husband into two parts. And we should remember this, you know, the, these are heirs of the husband. So the wife is obviously involved in a sense, because that is how it will percolate downwards. So what uh, Section 8 does is, or that schedule rather does is, it divides the heirs of the husband into two categories, Class 1 and Class 2. Now, Class 1 heirs are who? Class 1 heirs are the children of the family, the children of those particular husband and wife. And if the wife is no more, it will go down to the, uh, the children who are the Class 1 heirs of the husband also. Then it also goes to uh, the, the grandchildren, or to the mother of the husband. So there is a balance which is put out. And please remember, the father of the husband is a class two heir. So only if there is no class one heir of the particular husband, it will go to the father. So there is no question that, you know, that if, if there is a self-acquired property of a female Hindu who dies intestate, the in-laws will jump in, you know, uh, you know as, as in when it happens. So there is a there is a division in that in that in the act itself no. and the, the protection provided in the act itself. I agree. I agree with the classification and the details that you've provided, Namit Saxena. But my question is, you know, this the provision that is there in the law that puts husband's family first when it comes to inheritance when a woman dies without a will. Do you think it is time to remove this provision now with the change in society that we are seeing? You know, when we talk about equality, uh, there are many families around us as well uh, where there is only one girl child and, uh, you know, she 
takes care of the family, the parents as well, uh, once she's married. It is happening in the society today. So now, with this change in society, do you think this provision should now go? No, I don't think there, is, there are uh, safeguards in the act itself, in the schedule itself. See, when we talk about the family of the husband, the family of the husband is what is percolating downwards. That is why I must read what, is, what are the class one years of the husband. They are the son, the daughter, the widow, the son of a predeceased son, daughter of a predeceased son, and it goes on to say that these are, uh, you know, the, the family which the husband makes with the wife. So if the wife dies, it goes to the heirs of the husband who are these. Only in absence of a class one heir, it will go down to the class two heirs. And only in absence of class two heirs, or if there are no cognates, it will go to cognates, as uh, Karuna also pointed out. So there is no, you know, in my opinion, and when we see, as, as Karuna also pointed out, the 2009 judgment that the center has, you know, given in the affidavit, the Dom Prakash uh, uh, versus Radha Sharan judgment, it, it, in a sense, it's, it's, it stamps where there is a self-acquired property, section 15 is to be followed. Perhaps that is why the Supreme Court has now referred to a three-judge bench. And let's see what, what they take. But the center's stand is this, that uh, this does not violate. And also see, uh, a parliamentary enactment cannot be shrugged off simply just because there is an allegation that it violates patriarchy. Patriarchy is not a constitutional argument. As Karuna pointed out, it has to be seen from Joseph Shine's judgment or other judgments which have so, now, you know, lately came come on. No. But Karuna, isn't this then a hurdle in this march to equality? Inaji, you can please call me Ms. Nandi or Karuna Nandi, like you called him Namit Saxena. The problem with the act is that um, patriarchy is uh, actually a constitutional argument. I would urge you to read Joseph Schein. I would urge you to read uh, Anuj Garg. I would read, in fact, urge you to read Article 15 of the Constitution which says that you cannot uh, discriminate without a compelling state interest, without adequate, uh, without strict scrutiny, etc., against, on the basis of sex, religion, and other categories. So, yes, taking patriarchy out of the law is very much a constitutional argument and is made uh, happily um, on a more and more a regular basis. And in fact, it would be, and I would say that Hindu women's rights should really be front and center because Hindu women are sort of the majority of women in this country. And whenever there's an issue of Muslim women, whether it's the very rare situation of halala or triple talaq, of course, Muslim women brought their own rights and it was very important. Then we see some kind of sort of great push by the... Uh, uh, you know, by by some enthusiasts, and but when it comes to Hindu women's rights, then there is a real sort of conservative patriarchy that steps in, and I find this appalling, because why are there double standards for Hindu women and Muslim women? Hmm. Interesting. Uh, Karuna Nandi, Namit Saxena, thank you very much, both of you, for joining us here on Urban Debate on Mirror. Now completely out of time, but appreciate both of you for joining us on Urban Debate.